This 300ZX is now named Snowball. What started as a simple fix slowly went out of control and accumulated into an almost four month long project. So let's go back to the beginning where I had no idea just how much work I had ahead of me just to get this back on the road. Welcome back to Dan and Dave's Garage. And in this episode, we're gonna be looking at this 1986 Nissan 300ZX and doing a part two on getting this thing up and running for the summertime. Now, right now it is the end of February and about one year ago, I said this. To get this Z ready for cruising in the summer with the T-tops off, that I'm going to get this done. Now, of course, I actually did drive it around a little bit, but the unfortunate thing was that I never actually got to film any of the driving that I did. So I left everyone with a cliffhanger at the end of the first episode. I'm very sorry about and I'm going to show you what happened and why I stopped driving it. Until I did a little bit more snooping around, I didn't realize it at the time that the catalytic converter was actually really clogged. After I figured that out, I uh, disposed of that, drove it around, getting some miles on this, trying to figure out what else I needed to do. And then this happened. Well, unfortunately, now it sounds like absolute garbage. And because the muffler had blown up, I can't drive it anywhere without giving everyone tinnitus. And so it is way too loud. So we're gonna fix that. That's gonna be the step one of getting this thing back up and driving. And of course, why didn't I do it earlier? I mean, just look around. It's a little busy right now. So here I have the new muffler. Well, it's a muffler, it's not rusted out, and it doesn't have a hole in it, so I think it'll do. I'm hoping that this doesn't fight me too hard. That's my plan, but I'm not convinced it won't. After removing the old exhaust, I need to reuse the intermediate pipe, so I cut it off, which showed an obvious issue. No local parts store had any adapter that what? fit, and it was such a weird size difference, I gave up trying to find one, packed up the muffler, and returned it, which gave me some time to do what I do best. Well, looks like I can't just slap this muffler on, so time to just let this project sit for another couple months. All right, it's a little over a week later, and this showed up at my doorstep, so let's actually make sure this thing fits. And it's just got like really windy, so a lot more miserable than it was before. New exhaust came with an intermediate pipe all in one, no welding required, which is easy, and even easier, bolts are right in. Nice. Although it is crush bent and ugly, you don't really have a ton of options. Don't care as long as it works, which it did. And of course, the tips aren't level. I won't fix it just to bother you, but most importantly, how does it even sound? Really obvious there is still an exhaust leak somewhere further up in the system. The smoke is from me dumping seafoam into the gas tank, so no reason to worry yet. Okay, still sounds like trash, but this gasket i think is going to be the next fix i think what happened was as the catalytic converter was clung it just blew out the next weakest link so i think that's the gasket that's between the header and the i guess you call it like a mid pipe or intermediate pipe so we're gonna try and pull that out next that was the garage is a little full right now but this will do Okay, we're up in the air, and while I'm here, I might as well check. There was a little bit of looseness in the steering that I could feel driving it around, so not I'm just thinking maybe a little bit side to side, like very slight, but let's try. Yeah, you can hear that. Is that wheel bearing? Let me get you guys underneath and get a better look. And from here, we can definitely confirm it's a wheel bearing. Okay, other side. Definitely side to side play. And definitely same up and down knocking. So feeling like this is also wheel bearing. And of course, the steering rack is blown on both sides, hemorrhaging fluid everywhere. Very limited space to fill, but I got it out without too much of a hassle. Okay, looking at this exhaust surface here, I don't really see much of anywhere where there are leaks. Same thing with the gasket. Everything looks, I mean, just as crusty as I expected it to be, but no real soot on the outside so i don't think this was leaking but look at this someone tried to connect this egr pipe with some like silicone hose and this is the explosion that i heard was this pipe 
blown up. So what I'm going to do instead of replacing this is just get rid of it. I'm going to cut it here, roll it over, pinch it, and run a bead of weld across, seal it up for good, and we don't have to worry about this anymore. There was also a crack up here that I tried to fill in. So we'll see how well it works, but you know, it doesn't have to be pretty and it's a good thing that it's hidden. And this is the only time anyone's ever gonna see it. And with the fresh gasket installed, back into the Z it goes. And of course, got busy with something else and it sat. Now it's actually the hard work, which is getting all the little stuff done. Now we just gotta move this out of the way, get the turbo car out and put this in the garage. So we can get started on this. Yeah, and everything's green behind me because I've uh, not been working on this. <laughs> but now it's time to work on it. Let's go. All right, back in the garage where it's gonna be for what, like three months? Just kidding. It's not gonna be that long. I actually wanna drive this. The next day I got straight to work with my little helper, who lacks thumbs and isn't actually much help at all. With the car up in the air, wheels come off first. I need to get a better look and see just how bad everything is underneath the car. This front suspension is very crusty and has obviously seen better days. It's missing both the dust boots and bump stops, which will help accelerate wear, and the rubber strut tops are cracked. Tie rod ends and ball joints have torn boots, so they're on their way out as well. This steering rack is getting tossed out, and thankfully we have a good one from the Dona car. And as luck would have it, this whole front end needs a rebuild. Can add front strut cartridges to that list while we're at it. For springs, I'm digging into my parts stash and using a set of 87 turbo springs, which are a stock upgrade and stiffer than what had come with this car originally. Also notice that all these brake lines are original, so we're going to get all six for the whole car. In the rear, it's a little better, but not by much. One in the rear shocks is visibly leaking and obviously, again, missing dust boots and bump stops, so we can add those to the list. With all that, the parts list is getting pretty long, so while this trickles in, let's start taking stuff apart. First step is removing the brake caliper and moving it out of the way. With new brake lines on the way, it's okay to let it hang. Next, we can remove the wheel hub and set it aside to be rebuilt later. Now we can split the McPherson strut from the steering arm. It's just two bolts and then a ton of leverage. With the top three nuts undone, we can now remove the strut assembly. It's also easier to undo the front sway bar to get a little more droop from the control arm. And just like that, the other side is also just more of the same. Yeah, and of course you couldn't see it with everything together, but this boot is obviously torn. Uh, not doing too much. Went ahead and sucked out the brake fluid, which had a layer of sediment in the reservoir and rust floating around in it. Not a good sign. Pretty dark. Probably can't tell, but there's stuff floating in there. Now that the struts are out of the car, we can start this assembly. Working with these is important to have the correct safety equipment and make sure to use spring compressors to not injure yourself. I'm living life on the edge, so I'm doing them fast, easy, and the dangerous way. And with little persuasion, they come apart easily. Okay, this is a bad sign. Squeeze it in, and it doesn't move. These gland nuts are completely rusted solid, so we're going to soak them with penetrating oil and apply a little bit of heat to work it in. Let it soak and come back later. This part is actually dangerous. Overheating the strut tube too much and you risk the gas shock exploding. Just something to consider. While those are soaking, we can work on removing the rear shocks and springs. To access the rear shock mounts, we need to remove the large plastic wheel arch covers, which means the rear half of the interior needs to come out. I had already removed the carpet, and it's now the tedious task of not trying to break almost 40 year old plastic. Luckily these interiors are relatively straightforward and come apart easily, and I managed to not break anything, which is a huge win. A couple of hits from the impact and it's quick work of the mounts. If you don't want your shock to violently disappear like it does here, put a jack underneath the control arm to stop it from dropping. Just one bolt remaining on the bottom and it's out. Super easy to do. This guy was obviously leaking, so it's a good thing it's being replaced. Removing the rear springs actually required the spring compressors and a lot of leverage. And again, the trick is to remove the shock first and then loosen the sway bar to get full droop. With the penetrating oil done working its magic, we can shift our attention back to the struts. This one came off without a hassle, and with the gland nut off, we can just slide the cartridge right out. This is what it looks like when you don't have the dust boot. The seals fill up with debris and eat away at the rubber, causing leaks. On the other hand, this one took a lot more heat and physical violence to come apart. 
Of course, this cartridge did not want to just slide out as easily. I beat on this forever to pull it out, but eventually resorted to putting it in the vise and using the whole strut body as a slide hammer, which did the trick. When we put these back together, I'm going to oil them really well to make sure they don't corrode like this again. This is what the fully disassembled spindle looks like. Covered in 40 years of dirt, grease, and grime, it's going to get first a wash and then a quick coat of paint to make it look like new. I can't possibly put it back on the car looking disgusting. And while those are drying, some parts arrive. Well, a bunch of new parts showed up, so we can start putting these bad boys together. Still waiting on the front cartridges. Those are coming in, but we can start actually doing a lot of the other suspension parts, the ball joints, the brake lines, and we still have to pull out the steering rack. So pretty straightforward, just kind of, you know, just slap this all stuff together and let's go. The old ball joints need to get pressed out of the control arms, which is really easy with the ball joint press kit. No control arm removal necessary. And it's available in our Amazon affiliate link down below. We can finally now start installing new parts, starting with the new ball joints, left and right, and then going ahead with some easy brake lines. With the lines off the car, you can now just see how badly deteriorated they were. Definitely due for replacement. There are six soft lines in total for the car. Two in the front and four in the rear. And they're all pretty easy to replace. We can shift our focus to the next easiest item on the list. Completing the rear suspension. The 87 turbo springs will go in first. And they went in easier than expected. These are a bolt-on upgrade and are the second stiffest springs from the factory behind the Shiro Special, which makes them significantly stiffer than the original non-turbo springs. We can add the old shocks to the pile and install the new dust boots and bump stops. Not sure that's right. Of course, I don't have a good example of one that is put together correctly, so... Oof, no struggle. We'll see how it looks. With them all assembled, it looks really good on the car. Almost like this car has been taken care of. And here's a glamour shot of the rear brake lines that were installed. I know it doesn't look like it because of the magic of editing, but half of this project's time was spent cleaning, and this rear interior was no exception before putting it back together better than it was before. Just like that, the back half of the car is done. I'm still trying to nurse myself back to health, so my voice is still a little bit weird, but... Anyways, now we can focus on everything in the front. So that means we're gonna be pulling out this power steering rack to put in the one that was graciously donated from the old turbo drift car. So that's gonna be going in. Next, I have the parts as well for a hub rebuild. So we got new wheel bearings, new wheel seals, do that, throw everything else back together, put this thing back on the ground and drive it. I don't. This thing's been on the jack stands for longer than the couple minutes you've seen it. So I'm really itching to drive this thing and I'm sure you guys want to see it on the road as well. So let's start tearing this front end apart even more and we'll uh, start putting some things back together. When we first got the car almost a decade ago, the power steering worked fine until all of a sudden it didn't and it let us know by hemorrhaging fluid all over the driveway. We installed a rebuilt unit, and the warranty expired maybe just a month before it relieved itself of all of its fluid again. Discouraged and annoyed, we just removed the power steering belt and kept driving without it. This job isn't hard, it's just annoying. Lining up the hard lines so as to not cross thread the soft aluminum body is a true test of patience, as well as having to jack up the engine to create enough of a gap to slip the rack in and out. Also going in blind on two of the four mounting bolts and risking cross-threading there. And of course, touching all of this, you have to get an alignment and pay for that. I was cheap and I didn't get new inner tie rods even though I probably should have. So I'm reusing the old ones and added a bunch more work to myself, swapping them over from the old rack onto the good one. On goes the boot and we'll zip tie that down and then just simply repeat for the other side. Now that the rack is all tidied up, it's ready to go back into the car. Just now I have to carefully snake it through the small gap between the engine and cross member, line it up over the mounts, bolt it down, and then reconnect the lines. We'll bleed this system once all the steering is back together. 
The paint has dried on the strut tubes and are ready to be put back together with new struts, top mounts, dust boots, bump stops, and hardware. I'm spraying some fluid film down the tubes themselves so that we don't have any more rust issues. To install the strut, just insert it in the tube and tighten the new gland nut snug. Next, go on the boots and bump stops, top spring mount, which both spring mounts have a notch I'm making sure to line up that the spring actually seats into. Next is the strut bearing and finally the top mount and it won't fit. Of course the opening is not just a simple circle which could be drilled out but more of a D shape with a flat so this is not something I want to modify. Unfortunately these are just machined wrong from the factory so it's time to return them and wait of course a week for different ones to arrive. So we can start working on something else. Oh yeah there we go. Problems written on the box. While I'm waiting, I'm going to go ahead and start rebuilding these hubs. Of course, I forgot to turn the mic on, so this is really nice and quiet. I'm going ahead and replacing both inner, outer bearings, races, and wheel seals. This job is super messy, greasy, and not exactly what I would call fun. I'm going to first start by scraping out all the grease so I can see what I'm actually doing. And to remove the inner bearing, we need to first remove the wheel seal, which you can try to remove it with a seal puller or be like me and punch a screwdriver through it and pry it out that way. After all, it's not being reused. Bearing comes out and we can clean up even more grease and then we can start punching out these races. There are two notches or grooves machined in on the inside of the hub to drive out the races. This really should be done with a brass drift so you don't mar aim the surfaces and I don't have one so I'm being a little bit more careful than I would normally be and just using an old extension. Drifting out both the inner and outer races are the same process. Someone had obviously been here before because these were cheap, no-name bearings. Here's an idea. When you buy parts, make sure they're actually proud enough to put their name on it. Trash. Well, here we go. We got the new bearings. Oh, yeah, there we go. We got the new bearings. And these are the fronts, and these are the rear with the wheel seal. So, we'll put those in. And they're different sizes, so you don't have to worry about messing it up. The only way you can mess up is if you put the taper the wrong way. So make sure you don't do that. This is how it's going to go in on both sides. Don't mess it up. To start the race, I have a small brass mallet that I'm using to start it evenly. Getting an even start makes it a lot easier for you to install and stops you from making dumb mistakes down the line. Once it's started, I'm going to use the old race to help drift it in. Once the old race is starting to get deeper into the hub, one trick is to actually take your death wheel, cut a slit into the race, and this will give you enough slack to seat the new race all the way down while also being able to remove the old one that you use as a drift. The sound will change while you're installing when it's fully seated and you're all set. The same applies to the other side. Next we need to pack the inner wheel bearing before we install the wheel seal. Alright, fresh tub of grease, fresh gloves. Fresh wheel bearing, you know the drill, let's pack it. Okay, next is the wheel seal, and it goes like that, a little lip on the outside. And this, we're going to very carefully make sure that it goes in straight, because if it doesn't, then you're going to try and pry it out and bend it, and you're going to need a new one. So uh, I did that mistake on my Land Cruiser, and so I'm going to try not to make that mistake here. And it's just below the lip, so we'll call that done. And then, of course, for this front, we're not going to worry about that until we actually put that on the car. So uh, we'll leave this covered and make sure no dust, dirt, debris, or whatever gets in here. Put this away, get another one done. The first hub was actually super easy compared to the other side, which fought me so hard trying to remove the races. This is what the surfaces looked like after spending maybe 30 minutes beating on them. Taking it apart sucked, but surprisingly, it all came together with no issues. Okay, three days later, and these have finally showed up to my door, and uh, <laughs> let's make sure that these actually fit, and we can slap everything together now. And I think this is the last roadblock before 
uh, you know, we can put this on all four wheels. It's been on jack stands for way too long, so uh, we just got to power through it. <sighs> okay, let's go. That's how it's supposed to go on. Easy. Oh, and of course, you know, I'm forgetting to uh, put other parts on. Oh, geez. With all the rest of the parts on, we can tighten the nut and call it done. This completed strut looks practically brand new. Now to just start the other side. This one was a little tricky as this was the one that had the C strut, so obviously the new one needed to be tapped in place. And this is about the part where I realized something was wrong with the gland nut and started to get a bad feeling. Yep, it was actually starting to cross thread, which is arguably the strongest type of thread, but not appropriate for our application. So now the threads need to be cleaned up somehow. But this is finally on and I didn't film any of it because it's just so frustrating. I had to take out the new strut, which I think I blew out the seals doing that because I had to beat it out because I had to beat it in to get it in. So, uh, but cleaned up the threads. Um, obviously I had to get a little bit creative trying to do this because Good luck finding a tap this size that is not, you know, a ridiculously expensive. So, or if you could figure out what size it is, right? But anyways, got it in. And, you know, you might wonder, well, why do these projects take so long, right? Because this one little misstep cost us a little bit over an hour and a half. Yeah, it's a lot of time. But now, now should be smooth sailing and we'll get this strut all together. I'm proud to say these are finally together and they both look really good. Now, I wonder how they look on the car. As is a common theme, there are a few steps before we can actually see them on the car. The steering arm goes in along with the tie rod end, and both get torqued down with new cotter pins. Oh, actually kind enough to put the letter F here for the front. So this just goes right up. God damn it. If you ever think about buying this Ryobi flashlight it fucking sucks battery life sucks the magnet sucks it sucks at being a light that flashlight really is a disappointment for $35 and this outburst was a culmination of it falling on my face multiple times and constantly dying on me seriously Ryobi fix your shit anyways we can get all the small details ironed out by torquing down the strut tube assembly to the steering arm getting the dust shield installed Spindle lubed up, hub thrown on, and a new wheel bearing tossed in. I hate the sound. Okay, that's better. Tried my best to follow the service manual bearing preload procedure, so we'll see if I did it right oh, and gosh. how fast it takes me to ruin them. may have ruined this battery letting it discharge completely so let's see please i don't feel like spending more money for a battery and it's not even that old now that everything is back together underneath the car suspension wise and everything is put in new brake lines all that calipers we can now focus on bleeding the brakes and of course, we have one little tiny step to do before that. This old brake master cylinder was leaking and as evidenced by a lot of flaking paint off of the brake master cylinder and on the frame rail on the inside here, it's been leaking for a little bit and it needs to be replaced. So that's where this comes in. This was actually in my spare parts bin. Uh, I cleaned it out, made sure it was nice and clean on the inside, uh, bench bled it, and now we are ready to install. Now we just have to remove this one and carefully remove it. Yeah, you think it's been leaking? Just try not to spill more brake fluid around and then we'll be good to go. We can actually start bleeding all the brakes now. So just, you know, uh, one step at a time. We'll finally get there. For now, I'm by myself in the garage and the best way to do this without a second person or a power bleeder is just do a gravity bleed. I have the opening of the vinyl tube above the level of your reservoir and the air will find its way out to the top. 
did this method very successfully with my hard body, so I'm just going to keep doing it. I hope it's just loose and not the hard line broken. Next we can bleed the power steering system by first filling up the reservoir and turning the steering wheel lock to lock without the engine running. Those bubbles are air trapped in the system and we just keep going until the bubbles stop. Okay, the brakes are bled and the power steering reservoir has been filled up. As you saw, there's some bubbles coming up. So uh, now we're gonna get the engine running. The power steering belt is on. Go lock to lock, try and get as much air out as possible with no load on the steering. And we'll check for leaks there once there's actually more pressure. And let's make sure the uh, engine doesn't fall off the jack stands. Idle is, super, idle is super wonky because I don't have any of the idle controls, but now we've got some, some frothing in here. Stuff is spinning around for the first time and now we've got some, some frothing, which to be expected, not a big deal. It's good that we didn't let it run for long and that it just died so that it gives it a chance to not run without any fluid in it. Just moving side to side. It's a lot of frothiness. Maybe it sucked down a little bit. Okay, looking underneath. Underneath, I don't see anything. So, looking pretty good. I'm calling the power steering done. With the engine running just a little bit and getting a little bit of heat in, we can do a quick oil and filter change. Now it's time to put all four wheels back on the ground. Thinking I was done, I moved the car out of the garage and into the driveway to get ready to take it in for an alignment. I didn't manage to take it far until I suffered a catastrophic brake failure, with the pedal going all the way to the floor. Immediate suspicion was the brake master cylinder, thinking that since it was sitting and maybe I cleaned it wrong, I should just get a new one. But that turned out to not be the issue. What the f- Okay, hard to tell exactly where the leak is coming from, but it looks like this section of the frame rail has been pushed in and these lines have been pushed up a little bit. Somewhere under here looks like it's probably been kinked or bent enough and then rust started and weakened it. All right, I didn't think that this was gonna make a star appearance, but this is the 86 turbo shell that if you caught the episode, we're working on this. This is where all the good parts went into and I've been holding on to it until I feel very comfortable that I have everything I need. And if you look, just about everything is gone, except we have the brake line. Starting from here, all the way here. All right, brake line here, and it goes all the way down to there. Through a lot of struggling, I eventually fished out the busted line, and you can see where the line was rubbing up against the body and has a hole in it. This is less than ideal. I managed to snake in the new line, take it to get in alignment, and finally take it out for a test drive. This was the last piece of the puzzle. Miata slow. So you're 
and that's like NA Miata slow, right? These cars only have 165 horsepower, so you're not really going to be, you know, throw back into your seat, you know, as you're ripping gears up and down the highway, doing the highway pulls. You know, that's this car's not made for that. If you want to see a car that is made for that, check out the video that was done with David and his BMW 6 Series that he got at auction. That thing's pretty cool. V8 twin turbo with the M package. But anyways, with this car, that this is a completely different beast, right? I mean, this car is almost 40 years old, and I think we've got it to a point where it's as good as it's gonna be without spending a shit ton of money. Give it some beans. You know, it's fun. And I do like it because you can go a speed that is still legal and have fun. Doing all the suspension work right now, you can see, probably see I'm still a little bouncy. And I think that's just a limitation of the almost, you know, 40 year old design that is, you're kind of limited with, with the car, which not a big deal because you kind of just understand what the car is and what it can do. Um, and obviously, you know, you have, if you really want to make this thing handle, you have to spend big money on coilover conversion and actually cutting and welding the spindles to adapt the coilovers. You know, that would be like the best bet to make this thing really handle. A couple other upgrades that I was kind of eyeing were the strut braces. Being that this is a T-bar roof, you know, T-tops, uh, you do lose some rigidity, right? This is not a slick top, which would be you know, cool, but I do like the T-tops because it is super 80s. They literally don't make them anymore. They don't make them like they used to. So getting some of those strut bars for the front and maybe the rear, I think would really tighten up the car up even more. But besides that, I'm happy with the results that that I've achieved here. Now this thing is fun and I'm really excited to actually drive this thing around. Now we're going onto the highway, giving it some beans, third gear, fourth, 65. And we are at pretty much the limit here in Virginia. But besides it being, you know, a little bit too warm out with the defrost on, the car's comfortable. The car's a little bit loud, so maybe some sound deadening, you know, when all the body work is done. But I can pass comfortably, I can keep up with traffic, and my steering wheel, pretty steady. It was just going through a little turn, but look at that. I've never been able to do that in this car before, so I think we definitely fixed all the nagging issues with the suspension and steering, and I am very glad for that. You know, kind of the big question now, right? Was the work worth it? For me, yes. This car has got some sentimental value to me because this is this is uh, my brother and I's first car gift from our dad, so. For us, definitely worth it. You know, the amount of work that was put into it would have mechanically totaled the car. If you had someone else do it, and plus who wants to work on something like this? To actually have one of these running nicely, you have to work on it yourself. You know, I don't think you can go to a dealer. Anyone that's worked on this when they were back is retired or dead. So you can't really go to a dealer and expect good quality work done. And uh, I just really don't know what, uh, you know, are they, are these worth keeping around, right? If you find one in rough condition, I think it's gonna be a hard sell to, to keep it on the road. Really, the parts are getting too expensive for what the values are. Um, but for me, it's definitely worth it to keep this thing on the road. And I really enjoy driving this thing. Just ripping around on these back roads is too much fun.
Well, that wraps up this episode and we got so much accomplished and I'm very proud of myself and you, the viewer, for sticking along. If you enjoy this episode, do what is most important and show us that you actually like the video by liking the video. It is free. It's the best way to support the channel because it helps us get traction and it lets us know that we're doing a good job. So also leave a comment, what you wanna see done with any projects or anything you see behind us if you wanna see videos on that. And uh, I think that about wraps it up because it's getting wicked hot outside and uh, I gotta go in. So see you next time.